much support, not just providing for the Secretary of State to be accountable to Parliament for the National Health Service. I think that the National Health Service itself also needs to go back to some pretty basic principles. Uh, I know when the Health and Social Care Act was being debated in Parliament, we were very, very clear that Section 75 was not a good thing. Now, uh, that's any qualified provider, that's the tendering of services and so on. I actually think we need to be moving towards not just an integrated health and care system like we're starting to develop in Tameside, but as part of that, you strip out some of the waste that does go on, uh, particularly, as you say, in terms of legal costs, tenders and, and, and so on, because you have a public provider. Um, and uh, you, you break down that commissioning split and I think that, that actually that is quite an important back to basics principle as we're driving forward uh, the integration agenda. But that's why accountability is really then quite crucial, not just at the national level but also at the local level. Why we've really got to empower local authorities to do a much better job of scrutinising these new integrated health organisations because when you're talking about a public body spending public money in the public sector there has to be that challenge that that money is being spent right. Now I don't agree with the free marketeer approach where the challenge was through the market, the challenge was through com uh, competition, the challenge was through privatisation. I think that you can provide adequate challenge through democracy and that's really the system that we've got to develop in places like Tameside to make sure that these guys are spending public money in the right way, uh, commissioning good public services for the people of Tameside, and actually there's a challenge there for the Health and Wellbeing Board, for the Overview and Scrutiny Panel to make sure that those that are commissioning the services are really held to account. So I'm, I'm fully on board with what you're saying, and actually I think that we do need to sweep away uh, things like Section 75, any qualified provider, and so on. I think the NHS being a uh, public service is absolutely uh, important. And I know that um, Andy Burnham, when he was the Shadow uh, Health Secretary, and now as our Greater Manchester Mayoral Candidate, is really quite keen at looking at how we start to bring the care system back into the public sector because actually the private care system is what is absolutely crucifying the NHS uh, in places like Greater Manchester because you've got the double whammy of um, local authorities not being able to put the packages in place uh, to deliver quality care at, the, uh, at home, people ending up in hospital, I hate the term bed blocking, delayed discharges and so on, primarily because there are adequate care spaces in the private sector, either in terms of absolute numbers of spaces, but also the quality of care. Um, and again, it's something that uh, in Tameside and also in the Stockport part of my constituency, uh, the NHS are looking at how they start to bring uh, care provision in-house um, and actually I think that that then starts to develop the concept of a national health and care service, a fully integrated service because care shouldn't be seen as something separate, it is integral uh, to uh, the NHS as well. So I think you're absolutely right in the point you make and some of the decisions that Parliament has made, not just in the last Parliament with the Health and Social Care Act but going further back, um, have been to the detriment of a public NHS and we need to go back to basics on some of those issues and that's something that I know the Shadow Health team have been working on for quite some time is how we put the public uh, back into the NHS and that is really uh, quite important. And I'd just say in terms of devolution, believe me it wasn't just the public that was kept in the dark. Um, now, I was really quite frustrated as a Greater Manchester MP, and remember Andy Burnham was a Greater Manchester MP as well, and I can remember sitting on the front bench, we were in a health debate, the week that the 
leaders of Greater Manchester were signing the Memorandum of Understanding with George Osborne to devolve all of this uh, health budget to Greater Manchester, and we knew nothing about it. And I got an email. Now, my constituency covers two boroughs, Tameside and Stockport, and at the time, Stockport was a Liberal Democrat controlled council. Tameside's been a Labour council for as long as I can remember. I didn't get an email about this from the Labour Council in my constituency. I got an email from the Chief Executive of Stockport, the Liberal Democrat Council in my constituency, that had a draft copy of the Memorandum of Understanding attached to the email. And I quickly sent my phone down the line on the front bench to, so that Andy could see it. And believe me, that was the first we knew about it. Greater Manchester MPs, shadow health ministers, the shadow secretary of state, and we've been completely cut out of any of the discussions that have been had. Now, as I say, devolution can be an opportunity, but I really fear it is also a risk, because what might happen is what we've seen happen in Wales, where the Welsh Assembly have had their grant cut by Westminster, and it's very easy for Jeremy Hunt to point his finger when it suits, because it's very um, selective with where the NHS in Wales is failing, and actually in whole areas where the NHS in Wales is doing better than the NHS in England, it kind of skirts over uh, that because it's an inconvenient truth. Um, but, you know, very quick to point, it's Labour Wales, and I'm really concerned, and it is a challenge for devolution that he can't stand at the dispatch box and say it's Labour Manchester that's messing up the NHS as well, because we do have a funding gap. As I say, by 2021, the Greater Manchester Combined Authority are predicting it's £1.7 billion. Now, that's a very substantial funding gap in a health economy like Greater Manchester. Uh, just uh, just a, to A, <laughs> risk incurring your wrath, but B, to introduce a bit of nuance. Can I just, just slightly draw a distinction? And clearly my job, as Paul well knows, is my job is to represent the 238 NHS Trust and Foundation Trust. But to be frank, anybody who works in the NHS, I think would probably be slightly derelictious in their duty if they just didn't point out that there are bits of the NHS where actually using providers other than the core NHS has actually made a huge difference. The distinction I would draw is the difference between organisations who are seeking to make profit for their shareholders and organisations who are not doing so. And if I give you the really clear example, the hospice movement in this country has made a profound difference to end of life care. And actually they are not core NHS, they are not owned by the NHS, they are actually charitable organisations. And I think all of us, I would be very surprised if anybody in this room didn't agree that the hospice movement has made a fundamental kind of contribution. So all I'm just saying is, and I know of many charitable organisations, uh, and indeed many social enterprises, which are not core NHS, they're not profit-making organisations, but they have made a contribution. So we just need to be really careful about arguing that the only people to whom, you know, who should be providing care using the public purse are the core NHS. Clearly, the vast majority, quite rightly, of care is provided by those organisations. But I personally think there is an appropriate role in particular areas like the hospice movement for organisations that actually aren't making a profit for their shareholders to actually make a really important contribution. Sorry. 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 So just a couple of points I just wanted to comment on. Uh, when I talk about people being responsible and taking responsibility for their own health, I don't actually mean managing a budget and brokering the care that you might require, but I think a fundamental principle of citizenship is about looking after yourself. How do people, how, you know, if we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's really important to be healthy, to be well, if you're going to engage in, in society and actually make a difference to that society. And lots of people need support to be able to do that better at this level and have the resources available when they need more intense or spe specific specialised support, that's all that's about. And it is a big shift from where we are now. And talking about uh, just a comment you made about how do we engage the, the workforce. One of the things the RCN has done recently across Greater Manchester is to put a call out to our members across the 10 local authorities. Um, we had our inaugural meeting on Friday and we've got 60 members who want to work in the local authorities and to, to scrutinise the plans, 
to be a go-to voice to come up with. This is what the lived experience is for staff and patients living in this locality. These are the perceived gaps in your plans and these are the things that could be done differently. So we're looking at how we can strengthen and grow that as well. So um, hopefully, you know, it's an opportunity to make it better.